So in the talk today, I'm going to be presenting some data from our work looking into the ecology of giant rush, particularly its response to flooding. Um, and then secondly, some of our work into Moira grass. So it's a combination of experiments and field surveys. So firstly, giant rush. So as many of you are aware, um, giant rush is a native uh, plant, but it's become invasive in some areas of the forest. So this is um, a good photo to show that, um, one of Keith's aerial photos during the floods in 2011. So in the foreground is Steamer Plain, um, and in the middle is, is Barmer Lake, and some of those, those dark coloured areas. Do have a pointer? Oh, this button. Yeah, here we have um, the invasion of giant rush. So previous experimental work suggests that if you can overtop the stems for long enough, then you can start to kill them. So we were interested in seeing whether a large series of floods can actually remove some of these invasive stands. So to answer that question, we've got 20 survey sites on steamer plain um, in areas of giant rush invasion. What we were particularly interested in looking at was the duration of submergence. So at each of these 20 sites, um, we were able to estimate how long uh, plants had actually been submerged for during these floods. And this ranged um, from just four days in some sites up to several months in other sites, and that was dependent on the height of the plants. So we've conducted, oh, and this is just a good photo to show how dense it can get out there. So we were looking at dead stems, surviving stems, and the production of green stems, which you can see, you can see these green stems. Yep. So, we've conducted a few surveys over the last couple of years. This is just a hydrograph showing the floods from 2010 to 12. We've considered them as two flood periods, the first flood period being more prolonged and deeper than the second flood period. Our last survey was in February 2012, and that came after several months of quite shallow flooding and then flood recession. So firstly, some results from that first prolonged flood period. So what we have here is a graph showing stem recovery rate compared to the number of days that um, average height, height stems were submerged for. So by stem recovery rate, that was just the proportion of surviving stems and uh, the new stems produced. As you can see, it's a reasonably tight relationship um, with a decline in stem recovery with the number of days that plants were submerged for. And we found very similar results for other metrics that we calculated, like stem density, stem survival, um, and stem growth rates as well. So it looks like you need quite a few uh, months of flooding to get stem recovery rates down towards zero. So what does that mean for stem density out there on steamer plain? Well, it declined during that first flood period. So you can see these figures um, are quite high. It can be really, really dense in some areas. But when we went back after the first flood period, we saw that stem density did decline. Towards the end of the second flood period, however, we didn't see a further decline in stem density. It was around about the same. And that's because that second flood period just wasn't deep enough to submerge these stems. Then. As I mentioned, there was a period of shallow flooding, um, and that was extended by some shallow environmental flows. We went out there in February, and you can see the increase in stem density. So it suggests that these shallow conditions um, provide uh, good conditions for growth. So this is supported by our work in the glasshouse back in Canberra. So we've done several glasshouse experiments. What you can see here in this photo is just giant rush growing in tubes. Um, they've got about a metre and a half of soil to grow their roots in, and then we put tubes on top so we could actually submerge them. So this ran for about nine weeks. Um, the first graph shows the change in stem biomass. So under saturated conditions, that was just well watered with a couple of centimetres of, of flood water. That provided the best conditions for growth, but stem biomass did decline when they were submerged. And it was a similar pattern for root biomass as well, but even more stark. Uh, we also dug up bits of dead looking rhizome during that first flood period, took them back to the glass house in Canberra, potted them up in nice sort of well watered conditions to see, um, to look at their recovery. So again, these plants had been submerged for different periods of time. But out of the 20 plants that we took um, back, 17 of them recovered quite well. Uh, as you can see here, uh, new shoots being produced. 
again, after several months, we dug them up, and you can see their root growth there from the old rhizomes. Some of the rhizomes still looked pretty dead after a few months, but we dug them up, and what you can see here is a tiny little bug coming up. So they've got excellent, uh, strong recovery from rhizomes. <coughs> So that's some of our work, in looking, work looking at adult plants of giant rush. But we've also been looking at the flood response of seedlings as well. And that's because it's been observed um, quite extensive areas of seedling invasion in some areas of the forest. Uh, so this is a photo of Keats again during the drought on the edge of Barmer Lake showing extensive seedling encroachment. Then I took this photo in December on Steamer Plain, which is showing giant rush seedlings coming up through a patch of moira grass. So maybe giant rush as an adult is too big to flood, but maybe we can instead use shallower um, environmental water allocations to drown out new seedlings. So to answer this question, um, we conducted a, an experiment in a swimming pool. Um, I grew up lots and lots of giant rush from seed. Um, there's a tiny little plant here that's about 10-day-old giant rush seedlings. So we grew plants of three different ages, small, medium, and large. Small were 12, 12 centimetres, medium 17 centimetres, and large 33 centimetres. Half the plants were popped on the bottom of the swimming pool, and they had a 50 centimetre flood over the top. The other half was put on sand, so they had a 20 centimetre flood. And you can see the largest plants in the 20 centimetre flood actually were emerging out of the water. Some plants were left in for 12 weeks, then we took them out to see if they recovered, and the rest of the plants were left in for 20 weeks. So how did they go? Well, if you look at the first line of that table, that's the plants that were in the 20 centimetre flood for 12 weeks, and they all survived, no matter what size they were. But when we left them in for 20 weeks, we started to get some death, but only in the medium and small plants. So these guys here that were already emergent were able to survive and just kept on growing. Um, I have growth rate data as well that I can show you if anyone's interested. For the 50 centimetre plants, so that's the third line, again, they all survived after 12 weeks of submergence. So that's these plants here that were completely underneath the level of the water. Um, after the 20 week experiment though, we did start to get some death. Um, but still, for the large plants, we've got 76% survival rate. So we're looking at well over 100 days on average. Um, for these plants to start dying. We had some plants in a drought treatment, they died the quickest after just 60 days, and then we had other plants in just a wet treatment, which all survived, but they were much slower growing. The plants that grew the fastest were those in the 20 centimetre flood treatment. So an effective EWA to kill these guys would have to completely submerge the plants, and it looks like uh, longer than 20 weeks for the bigger ones partial submergence, and even if you submerge them by just a few centimetres, they're able to keep on growing out of the water and then grow quite fast. Okay, so that's um, the giant rush. And the next part of the talk is our work on the moira grass. So I'm just gonna focus on the Victorian side of the border, um, so in the Barmer Forest, because that's where I've been working. Um, Keith talked, or well, a few people have talked about the moira grass plains. A good description is that it's a mosaic of aquatic herbs. So moira grass as the species can dominate particularly during dry periods by persisting as a turf. But it, they can be quite floristically diverse. So moira grass isn't always the dominant species. How much is there? And again, this is just the Barmer side of the forest. These are some numbers that I've pulled out of the literature suggesting that it's declining and a recent MDBA report suggests there's about one and a half thousand hectares um, left. Not much is known as about its seed bank. So um, we've been looking at these questions. Firstly, the seed bank. We collected soil again from Steamer Plain. Um, soil was collected from places that had moira grass already present. Some places had giant rush present and other places just had open water or mud. And we germinated the soil back in the glass house. Uh, unfortunately, we only had 28 moira grass seedlings appear. Um, we did have a handful of plants growing from bits of fragments as well, but it was mostly seedlings. Quite a low number when we compare it to other plants. Uh, here's a, a little seedling here. Giant rush, over a thousand seedlings, and muriophyllum was our most common species. So if I standardise those numbers for the amount of soil that I collected, this graph shows that quite clearly. So this is just the number of seedlings in 100 grams of dry soil. 
Interestingly enough, for the giant rush, it seems contained to areas that already have a giant rush present. So it doesn't seem to be spread across the forest. Uh, the red bars show moira grass seedlings, and we have quite low numbers, but slightly more perhaps where we have got moira grass. So it suggests that at least for steamer plain, um, that the seed bank might be a bit depleted. So finally, um, this is a bit of work in progress that I wanted to present today. Um, it's a bit of a mapping project of the Moira grass itself. So while we were out there in amongst the giant rush over the last few years, we were looking around thinking, well, we don't actually see much Moira grass. So I decided we'd give it a go of actually mapping what is left on the ground using GPSs. So we've been to a lot of these, most of these areas in yellow, these are the open plain areas. Um, so I'm just looking at the open plain Moira grass, not Moira grass as an understory. Um, we've been surveying a few times over the last few months in the dry season because it's easy to, easy to access, but what we've mapped does seem to correspond with aerial photos taken during the floods. So surveying, I think in the dry season, I don't think we've missed too much Moira grass by doing it at that time of year. So far we've been to 29 open plains, some not as thoroughly as others because of ease of access. Um, so, for example, a lot of bowls we haven't walked through and some of the top of Barmore Lake here just because it's full of giant rush. So we're at the preliminary stages of analysis at the moment. So here's an example of some mapping. Um, this is Steamer Plain and it's really this area is where we're finding the most moira grass at the moment. The, the dark green is that sort of 100, almost 50 to 100 percent cover of thick thatch um, where it is the dominant species. So on Steamer Plain, this is a really good area of moira grass, but it is quite fragmented at the moment and it's also covered in brumbies. Here's some more moira grass here um, and it's being infilled by giant rush. Um, we found a lot up here in this plain and then as Bruce showed, there's some good moira grass up further in Hut Lake. There were areas where it's hard to map because it's intermingled with other species, so we sort of uh, measured the broader area and I've estimated the cover within that, and that's the different colours. So to give you an example, up in the top of Steamer Plain, uh, here's a moira grass patch intermixed with giant rush. Then over the creek into War Plain, um, that light green is the moira grass and mixed in with other snow and Elio Caris. So as the descriptions say, it's not always the dominant species, um, but we're particularly interested in finding out how much of this green, solid, thick thatch there is left. The other part of the forest where there does seem to be a fair bit is um, in Little Rushy Swamp and the area to the north of this, right up to Duck Hole Plain. But again, it's quite fragmented. And the further north we walked and mapped, the more giant rush we got. Oh, and here's some more evidence of brumbies in the foreground. So we got up to this swamp that I don't know the name of and up to Duck Hole Plain. We're seeing a lot of moira grass, but it is very intermixed with other species, particularly the giant rush. <clears throat> so I'm aware that this is just one point in time that we're looking at. So I'm interested in the trajectory of change. Um, and to help look at that, um, we're looking at some older historical photos. As an example, this is Harbour's Lake. It has one little sad patch down in the corner. Um, it was there when we mapped it in February this year, and it was there last year, in February 2012. Um, this photo from 2011 suggests it was about the same, some light-coloured um, green here. But then some of Keith's older photos show that change over time, particularly from 1998. So the idea is to try and get a picture of what's going on across um, uh, as many planes as we can. So far, um, what I've mapped, um, so I can digitise all this and calculate the area. It's about 187 hectares. This includes places where it's mixed in with other species. In terms of that pure thatch, 44 hectares, and there's areas where it is pretty healthy looking but it's mixed in with other species. That area of yellow I showed earlier works out to be about 1,500 hectares, which is closer to the published estimate of moira grass. So really, this is a good baseline to see whether it will rebound into the future. But to me, it raises the question of what we mean by a moira grass plain. And I'm keen to hear people's feedback about this, particularly um, those who've worked here for a while. What um, is the composition? Because there's some places where there appears to be no moira grass. And what is its structure? There's places where there is moira grass, but it's not really a grassland or a herb, herb land because it's um, got a lot of emergence in it. 
So that, that's um, all for my presentation. Um, in summary, Giant Rush, our data shows it's going to be very difficult to remove with flooding alone for the bigger plants, but maybe we can flood out seedlings while they're still small. If you want Giant Rush to expand, give it partial flooding. Um, pure thatch of moira grass in Barma seems to be pretty low. Um, how much does this matter? Thank you very much.